Welcome everybody. Um, November controversies in cardiology. Uh, just to remind people that our program is on www.heart-talks.org, um, which is where you can catch us now live or catch us uh, afterwards. Um, these programs have uh, become very popular because of the uh, great interest the topics have and the tremendous interaction in our panel. Um, just to tell you about our future uh, panels, in December, William Stevenson from Brigham and Women's. Uh, in January, Tony DeMaria. Um, in March, Joe Lascauzo. In April, uh, Ken El Ellenbogen. In May, David Holmes from Mayo Clinic. And in June, Chris O'Connor. Um, for those of you who don't read the daily news on a regular basis, um, it's probably more popular than New England Journal of Medicine in New York City. Um, but there was actually an article about Dr. Fuster. Uh, Dr. Fuster uh, spoke on weighing in on childhood obesity. And he was interviewed by Dr. Rooster, who's the Sesame Street character uh, named after him. I think he's the only living person uh, with a Sesame Street character uh, named after him. And the purpose is to really uh, start with the youngest generation and proper uh, diet, healthy living habits, to try to have an impact on uh, the epidemic of cardiovascular disease in the world. Uh, so really proud that Dr. Fuster also runs cardiology here at Mount Sinai. Today's controversy is actually uh, a fascinating topic, and we are privileged to have Andrew Marks, um, who had been here for numerous years and had so many people um, who he trained still here on faculty. Um, but to tell you more about the topic, uh, Samit Shah has a, a short review. Where is Samit? Oh, come on. It's actually a difficult topic, and he's taking us through the pharmacology to the clinical application of beta blockers in heart failure, myocardial infarction. Everything you wanted to know. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Uh, I say, Dr. Bill, thank you. <laughs> All right, so thank you, Dr. Goldman, and thank you, everyone, for attending tonight. Uh, so my name is Samit Shah, and I'm one of the first-year cardiology fellows. It's my privilege to introduce tonight's topic, contemporary use of beta blockers in heart failure. So let me begin with just some statistics. Approximately 5.8 million per, uh, persons in the United States have clinical manifestations of heart failure. Management of this disease contributes to this nation's escalating healthcare expenses uh, related to hospitalizations, loss of productivity, and cost of therapies. However, beta blockers is a cost-effective therapy and has been evalu evaluated in numerous trials consistently showing a reduction in mortality and hospitalizations in the range of 30%. I don't think there's anyone in this room that would disagree with this. It is remarkable, however, how the pendulum has swung in regards to our acceptance of beta blockers in treating heart failure. To appreciate the progress that has been made thus far, I'd like to take a moment to look back, back at our initial experiences with these agents. Almost 30 years ago, the use of beta adrenergic antagonists to treat left ventricular dysfunction was thought of as counterintuitive, in fact, heretical, uh, due, to the, due to its known negative inotropic properties, and likely led to the slow adoption of these life-saving therapies as a therapeutic option. Originally developed as a drug to treat angina and hypertension, beta blockers were embraced much more readily in the setting of acute myocardial infarction than heart failure. The first observation of the, of the benefit of beta blockers uh, in improving LV dysfunction and symptomatology of heart failure dates back to 1975 in a small open trial by Wagstein et al. This was shortly followed by the first evidence of improved survival in congestive cardiomyopathy in patients in 1979 by Swedberg et al. Despite this, beta blockers uh, were at best investigational in heart failure up until 1997 when carvedilol was first approved as a treatment in stable heart failure, paving the way for a dramatic shift in our understanding of beta blockade and its role in reverting the pathologic process of heart failure. Despite the advances and un unraveling the mysteries behind how LV dysfunction ensues and perpetuates, the answer to the perplexing question of how blocking a pathway that leads to contractility in normal hearts is able to enhance LV function in patients with heart failure remains elusive. 
While there have been numerous trials confirming the beneficial clinical effects of beta blockers, both in the setting of acute myocardial infarction, um, such as and causing LV dysfunction, to the more chronic process of congestive heart failure, an investigation into the molecular mechanisms behind cardiac dysfunction is imperative, as this sheds light into the fun, uh, fundamental mechanisms of beta blocker therapy. So let's begin by discussing the adrenergic system. In response to myocardial dysfunction, compensatory neurohormonal mechanisms, such as the adrenergic nervous system and the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, are activated, resulting in elevated levels of circulating catecholamines. It is now accepted that stimulation, whether acute or chronic, by elevated catecholamines results in toxic effects to the heart, whether directly or indirectly. This leads to downregulation of beta adrenergic receptors and a progressive impairment in response to inotropic stimuli as the comp composition of adrenergic receptors is altered. These effects are mediated by adrenergic receptors, predominantly beta-1, which via sec secondary messengers can ultimately converge on the endoplasmic sarcoplasmic reticulum, affecting calcium homeostasis, as well as stimulating pro-apoptotic and fibrotic pathways. These effects ultimately lead to LV remodeling, which further impairs contractility as the heart takes on a maladaptive shape. To compensate for the initial decrement in cardiac output, the adrenergic system, in addition to the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system, is further activated, leading to fluid retention and further dilatation of the LV cavity. This ongoing cycle continues to spiral downward and is the reason behind the significant morbidity and mortality behind heart failure. Our first line of defense was ACE inhibitors, particularly in reversing LV remodeling. However, beta blockers offer benefits that exceed, exceed those of ACE inhibitors, and in fact have shown be, to be additive to those of ACE inhibitors. This may be due to the fact that beta blockers have been shown to halt the ongoing process of adrenergic act, hyperactivity, and in fact may reset the density of beta adrenergic receptors. Mortality and heart failure is primarily attributed to sudden cardiac death sudden cardiac death and progressive pump failure. Beta blockers act by in increasing the threshold for arrhythmias uh, that could cause sudden cardiac death, as well as reduce heart rate, thus pro prolonging diastole, thereby improving myocardial perfusion, which is important in ischemic cardiomyopathy. Also, they inhibit renin-angiotensin system and improve oxygen util utilization, amongst other things. Ubiquitous in use, there are a plethora, a plethora of beta blockers in the market. And to the imperceptible eye, one may think that they're all equivalent in efficacy. However, their pharmacologic properties, which dictate their action, vary depending on their affinity for adrenergic receptors. The ongoing debate over whether third-generation beta blockers, such as carvedilol, which has the broadest range of adrenergic receptor blockade, as compared to metoprolol, the predominantly beta-1 selective adrenergic receptor, whether carv uh, 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 continues, and whether carvedilol Corvado offers an incremental benefit will surely be addressed tonight. Despite the overwhelming evidence of beta blockers in heart failure with LV dysfunction, there is a gap between guidelines and clinical practice. In a 2007 survey of uh, 1,919 outpatients with New York Heart Association class 2 to 4, only 65% of patients were prescribed beta blockers. Moreover, only 18% of these patients had achieved target doses, which we already know um, have sh uh, shown a dose-related effect. The underutilization of beta blockers and heart failure may result from our lack of understanding of its benefits in this complex pathologic process. Do we take their benefits for granted? Are we squeamish in starting this life-saving therapy in patients hospitalized for acute decompensated heart failure? When is it safe to start? Are there benefits seen in the heart failure preserved EF population, which constitutes about 50% of the heart failure population? I invite you all to join us as we tackle these questions tonight. And I'd like to thank Dr. Marks for joining us as well. Thank you very much, Samit, for an excellent summary. And uh, it's a pleasure to introduce Andy Marks here again. Last time that was in the same setting, forum was in 2003. And I'd like to say a few words uh, for those of you who are very young and you didn't meet him before. Now, he's a real New Yorker, Andy, but he has uh, 
He has been in the best institutions. Uh, he started actually in college, Amherst College, and then Harvard Medical School, where he received the MD degree. And then between 1980 and 1987, he had a number of positions at Harvard, particularly the Mass General, where he was intern, junior uh, resident, senior resident in internal medicine. Then he, has a post he had a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Genetics, and then he decided that cardiology was a good uh, discipline to get involved with. And so he did the Clinical and Research Fellowship in Cardiology at the Mass General. Uh, then he, we have, uh, in 1987, uh, he spent some time at the Brigham <clears throat> and at the Children's Hospital. I think that's where you met Bernardo Nadal, isn't it? Who put you into the biology, or at least in the molecular biology right. setting. So, and then he decided at that time, uh, uh, I met Andy, and we decided that Mount Sinai was a good place for him. So he came to Mount Sinai and he had a number of, uh, of um, positions, co-director of molecular and cellular cardiology, associate professor, molecular biology and physiology, and then director of the cardiology training program, and finally the Fishburg Professor of Medicine. He didn't, have a, he didn't have enough with all these titles, so he decided to move to Colombia to get few more. Professor of Medicine in 1997 and Professor of Pharmacology at Columbia uh, with a Director of Molecular Cardiology Program, Director of Center for Molecular Cardiology, and Chair and Professor of Department of Physiology and Cellular Biophysics at Columbia, which is a position that he has now. He's a very remarkable academician, frankly. I mean, he has, uh, first of all, if we go into recognitions, uh, awards, and honors. He has 30 of them, and it's difficult to choose which one is most important. He started with the uh, John Woodrow Award of the Amherst College, and then he moves on and ends up as editor of the Journal of Clinical Investigation, member of the National Academy of Sciences, American Heart Association Basic Research Prize. By the way, Dr. Hajar in uh, in a few days is going to be the Distinguished Scientist Award of the American Heart Association. I think you should all be aware. So the, what I mean, so not everything ends up with Andy Marks. <laughs> Still there is something left. Now, um, then he is Stanley Cosmeyer Award for the American uh, Society of Clinical Investigation, Harvey Society President, et cetera, et cetera. And then, um, in terms of invited lectures and, and professorship, he has certainly more than 50. I think it's interesting his uh, history of research grants. Um, he's one of those saying he's a usual at NIS, at NIH, at the American Heart, Howard Hughes, and uh, Doris Duke, and so forth. He has really been very well funded since the very early stages of his career by all of these organizations. Uh, as I mentioned, I think I did, uh, editor-in-chief editor of the Journal of Clinical Investigation between 2002 and 2007, and editorial boards of uh, Circulation Research, uh, Circulation uh, Consulting Editor, Journal of Biology, Ch Chemistry, and so forth. I think that um, I can go on and on, but I think what is most interesting, of course, is his bibliography and his contributions. Um, he has been working, uh, as far as I can tell, in, in the two different fields. The one field has been uh, on a smooth muscle cell in the vasculature, and he really is the pioneer, I would say, of rapamycin. Uh, as it evolved in his laboratory, it ended up with the uh, drugs that drug are looting stem. And I think that he started by working in transplantation. Is this correct in the transplant transplantation area? Now, the, then he has been uh, really uh, searching and understanding the, the physiology and the molecular mechanisms of how the myocardium contracts. 
and particularly how these uh, calcium channels work, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, the rhinodine receptor, and, and now he uh, really is in the opening door of uh, very small molecules which really can have a significant impact into issues like arrhythmias, uh, cardiac failure, uh, muscular dystrophy, and I think he, this is actually quite exciting. So I think that I would like to summarize by saying a very academically oriented and successful individual in which, in fact, his creativity never stops. Thank you very much for visiting us for the second time, Andy. So, maybe this is as usual as the NIH grants. I don't know in 2003 how this read. Well, as long as you keep inviting me every 10 years. Anyway, you your name is here. There are lots of things. Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is for you. Okay. And just for remember. Thank Thanks you. For coming. Okay, thank you. Very much. Thank you. So, what we are going to do is we are going to call the first, I ask uh, Dr. Pini to be the moderator uh, on this issue, um, and then Michael Domansky, uh, Roger Fajar, Jill Kalman. Lloyd Krakow and Jagat Narula, and of course, Samit Sa. Okay? So, there are enough chairs here? Maybe not. Yes. Yeah. All right, I offer you the chair. Thank you. While everyone is settling in, I, I was thinking over the weekend that um, one of the great things about cardiology over the last 20 years is that this has really been a, a laboratory for innovative therapies uh, across the board. And when you think back about the, the advances in percutaneous revascularization, advances in imaging, advances in electrophysiology, and, and you try to think about a revolution. There have been very, very few revolutions in the last 20 years, except for one, and that is beta blockers for the treatment of heart failure. And if you think about it, that was a very subversive idea, right? Beta blockers were contraindicated for treating heart failure. They made heart failure worse. 20 years ago, there were a bunch of heart failure cardiologists running around with this idea. They were sort of like rock stars, you know, breaking the mold with this subversive idea that we're going to go against the grain. We're going to give beta blockers to, to treat patients with heart failure. And, uh, and it worked. Um, what I thought as a, as a nice intro to tonight's discussion, I'm going to turn to, to Jagat, who about an hour ago was sharing a, a story with me about Dr. Weigenstein and, and Dr. Svedberg in, 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 um, in Sweden about the serendipitous use of beta blockers, and then we'll talk about the neurohormonal hypothesis. But Jagger, if you could just share that story with everyone about how beta blockers, if you will, were, were used for the first time in heart failure. Oh, I think uh, that's pretty pretty well known. Actually, it was 1973 when uh, Finn Wagestein was uh, doing a trial on uh, Practolog, an acute myocardial infarction. And they had a patient who had left ventricular failure. This was a lady uh, who was 49 years old, and she was intubated. She was uh, uh, in the, in the um, intensive care unit there. And uh, she had 140 heart rate, which was normal sinus rhythm, though. And uh, he wanted to give her Practolol. And uh, the nurse yelled at him, <laughs> saying that, are you going to kill the patient? And uh, at that time, uh, he just grabbed the syringe himself from the fractal all trial, went and injected intravenously, and uh, patient started improving. Then the patient was on alprinolol and finally on fractalol, and uh, the patient lived for 25 years thereafter. And actually, on the 25 years, there was a very decent write-up on, uh, on that. And uh, the other important thing which happened after that was that Carl Swedberg at that time was hired as the, as the fellow with uh, Finn Wagestein, and he did the first study with Hal, uh, with Hal, uh, Hal Marson and uh, Valentine, and that, that came out in uh, Lancet. So this was the Swedish optimism, and at the same time, there was a lot of pessimism in, in England that they felt that this was a wrong use of, uh, and I think Dr. Pooster would know in those, those days when, 
the there was so much of skepticism of the the studies at uh, in, in in Sweden, and the worst was which I have seen the slides from Abhijit Lahiri from uh, Northrop Park when he uh, when he worked with uh, Ed Raftery, and uh, they these are the glass slides where he demonstrated one slide to me when he used the carvedilol, and they were using the intravenous carvedilol which was available at that time from Roche. And uh, these people were using it, and he started using it in, in uh, heart failure patients. And he demonstrated by the MAGAs that there was 33 to, I mean, 13% uh, ejection fraction rose to 33%. But the man was suppressed, was told not to present his data because it was counterintuitive. Till Mike Bristo and others, when they really came up with the US carbidolol study, that, that really, really changed the whole paradigm although there were quite a bit of evidence which was already coming from the Merit HF and the MDC uh, trials and the CBIS-1 had already shown some benefit. Yeah, and as you said, I think the, the underlying hypothesis that then allowed the, these trials to develop was the neurohormonal hypothesis, basically the, the idea that in response to an injury, neuro circulating neurohormones, uh, which are in the short term there to support the circulation in the long term are actually detrimental and cause adverse remodeling, which is thought to, to propel the uh, clinical syndrome of heart failure and drive outcomes. Um, but the problem with the neurohormonal hypothesis is the fact that it's, it's a secondary hypothesis. It's derivative, meaning that something had to come first before neurohormones are activated. And that since it's an incomplete hypothesis, there are some people who believe that you can take a reductionist view and you can explain all of heart failure by understanding one thing. And if you understand that one thing and you manipulate it, you can fix heart failure. And that one thing is calcium signaling. And it's by no coincidence or no mistake that we have the, the, the yin and the yang of calcium signaling here with Andy Marks and, and, and Roger Hajar. So Andy, let, let me start with you and ask, what happens in heart failure that allows this perturbation in calcium signaling? Number one. And number two, do, do you subscribe to this reductionist view that if you can fix calcium signaling, you can fix heart failure? Well, it's a very complicated situation. And I do think, though, remarkably and quite unexpectedly, that it can be simplified down to potentially a, at least a unit of function in the heart, which regulates the calcium transient, which obviously directly determines contractility. And I think that the fundamental observation is that there is a depletion of calcium in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I think that there are a number of contributing factors, one of which is a leaky ranadine receptor, which my work is focused on. Another is a downregulation of circa. So there's less uptake and there's a leak out. So it's kind of like you're trying to fill your bathtub and you turn the spigot down and you also pull the plug out. And so you're gonna have less water and less calcium in the SR. Now, what causes this, I think, is the stress of myocardial infarction, decreased cardiac function, uh, or a dilated cardiomyopathy. And I think it's basically an oxidative overload state. And this both affects the release, making the channel leaky, and probably the uptake pathway as well. Now, I think there's a many, many other things that are going on, but our data, and I think the data from Roger and others, suggest that if you can target this calcium abnormality, you can have a very significant impact on progression of heart failure. And interestingly, our work has also shown that beta blockers, at least in part, work through the same pathway by also fixing a leak in the ranadine receptor by decreasing the phosphorylation oxidation. So remarkably, a number of different therapies seem to be converging on this abnormality in calcium. And I think fundamentally it makes sense because calcium is the determinant of the cardiac function. And then when we started this work, we never would have predicted that things could be reduced to such a simple observation. So I don't think that I can be accused of being overly reductionist. This is where the data are pointing us to. And so, Roger, uh, Andy described how the ryanidine receptor gets phosphorylated through adrenergic stimulation of the, the beta-1 receptor, leading to that, the, the leakiness of calcium out of the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. T tell me the, the circus story. Then how do you get a link between 
adrenergic stimulation and defective circa. Um, as Andy mentioned, uh, stress on the heart, whether it's ischemia or an adrenergic overload or stress, induces a set of genes to be upregulated, the fetal gene program, and part of that fetal gene program is the downregulation of circa. It can be adaptive early on, but over the long term, this could be, or this is maladaptive for the cardiac cell. So part of the uh, downregulation of circa 2A is in line with the stress coming on the cardiac cell, and eventually uh, the downregulation happens. As Andy mentioned, there are also multiple factors that induce uh, calcium cycling abnormality and the oxidative stress and the toxic milieu in the cardiac cell within the failing heart or uh, post-MI heart induces the same kind of changes on circa in terms of its uh, decreased function. Um, so Douglas Mann many years ago had shown that you know if you take single cardiac cells and expose them to high doses of norepinephrine, you basically get induction of apoptosis. And before that, you can get contractile dysfunction with calcium overload. And that calcium overload induces multiple changes within the cardiac cell, including uh, worsening of the Ryandine uh, leak and a decrease in circa downregulation. Uh, the only link that we have in terms of beta blockade and circa is that uh, in early trials, Mike Bristow did a very nice sort of invasive study that I don't think can be done now, where uh, he looked at patients who responded to beta blockers. Uh, by an improvement in injection fractions and ones who didn't. So he biopsied them before and after. And what he found was that if you looked at circa 2A, uh, the ones who did not respond by an improvement in function continued to have worsening in message, whereas the ones who actually improved with beta blockade had improvement in circa function. And I wonder if we can take these observations to try to get to a point in a few minutes to, to determine whether or not there is a best beta blocker out there or a best class of beta blocker out there. So I'm, I'm curious about the, the link between beta receptors, beta receptor subtypes, and, and what changes are witnessed in, in patients with chronic heart failure. So Dr. Narula, what do we know about the, the relative density, the relative proportion of beta 1, beta 2 receptors in patients with chronic heart failure? I think the first and the foremost thing here would be that the beta blockers are must, whether it is beta-1 selective only or it is beta-1, beta-2, and alpha-1. So the most important thing is to have the patient on the beta blockers. So that would be the, the first uh, um, uh, principle here. Now, as far as the comparison is concerned, I think I'll be a little biased because I'm, I almost exclusively use carvedil also. I will basically go more in the favor of the, the more comprehensive uh, uh, blockade. And uh, the reason only that I would uh, uh, propose here is that whichever studies you look at, basically whether it was in the acute myocardial infarction when the beta blockers were given within the first 24 hours, or you look at the beta blockers when they were given uh, from the 24 hours period to about one month period when they were initiated, and those which were given in the heart failure. Basically, if you look at all of them and you start classifying the beta blockers which have been given, you'll see that those which have received the beta 1, beta 2 non-selective agents, be it propanolol, timolol, carvedilol, they have done the best. Their, their improvements have been the, uh, the outcomes have been the best. If you look at only beta 1 selective beta blockers, quite like uh, metoprolol and atenolol and all, their outcomes have been good but not as good as they have been with the with the non-selective agents and if you take those which have been beta 1 or uh, selective or non-selective with the intrinsic sympathomimetic activity they have hurt patients even to the extent that they have increased the mortality even up to about 250 percent so if you look at the the heart failure, and if we have the comparison of uh, the two most important drugs which have been used uh, for the beta-1 selective, which is bisoprolol and metoprolol, you'll see that there has been an improvement approximately, if you do the meta-analysis, approximately about 30% improvement. You go with carvedilol meta-analysis, approximately 40% of the improvement. So uh, somewhat better thing. And if you go with the agents which have intrinsic sympathomimetic activity, they have been non-effective quite like 
and moxazosine uh, and all have been have been uh, uh, hurtful for for these patients and so my uh, thing would be that i would rather like to go towards a more comprehensive beta blocket rather than and essentially since it is a significantly increased adrenergic stress possibility would be the best if we will be using a non selective agent so there there must be a, a, a biologic mechanism underlying that observation that more complete adrenergic blockade beta 1 beta 2 being better than beta 1 itself so molecularly dr marks is there a difference in beta receptors is there a difference not just in the density but in also the the signaling pathways between beta 1 beta 2 um in terms of the regulation of the calcium defect we haven't seen any difference and i think the clinical differences uh may have to do with other activities of these drugs. I think one of the key aspects of the beta blockade, though, is the ability to have antioxidant activity. And there, as you know, carvedilol may have some advantage over some of the other beta blockers. Uh, on the other hand, I think that blocking the hyperadrenergic state will also have an antioxidant activity. So even some of the beta blockers that are not intrinsic antioxidants may have some antioxidant uh, benefit but certainly carvedilol does stand out uh, in that regard. And so I would uh, focus on that activity. So um, biologically, beta-1 is downregulated in heart failure, so beta-2 receptors go up. Uh, I mean, there is a difference between beta-1 and beta-2. Beta-1 receptors are very GS, simulatory G proteins, whereas beta-2 have a split uh, effect in the cardiac myocytes. And there's good evidence that there's a dose dependence of beta-2. So if you give lower doses of beta-2, so if you overexpress beta-2 receptors, you have a beneficial effect. At a toxic range, yes, you will get uh, a detrimental effect like you do with the beta-1. So in the field, there is a sense that you may want some beta-2 receptor activation because it has a dual effect. And at lower doses or lower dosing of the beta-2 receptor, you may get beneficial effect. So I can't really be in transients about whether it's better to block totally beta-1 and beta-2. It's clear you need to block beta-1. I think the beta-2 is still, uh, I mean, there's still some questions about it. I do agree with, with Andy that there is, uh, the antioxidant effect may be beneficial, an added benefit that can mitigate some of the uh, toxic effect within the heart uh, cell in that setting. So, Joe, one of the, the trials that compared these two drugs head-to-head, -head, it was a comparison between carbetalol and uh, metoprolol, short-acting metoprolol or metoprolol tartrate, so-called Comet trial. Um, do you want to comment on that trial? Was it a fair trial? Was it a balanced trial? One arm tied behind yeah, so its back, it's, so to speak? So it's always just like cardiologists. You know, we prove over 10,000 patients that beta blockers work, and then we spend the next... 10 to 20 years trying to figure out which one. And, and it's interesting when you look at heart failure versus acute MI and heart failure, it's the guideline state, which ones to use, which have been proven in against placebo. So carvedilol, long-acting metoprolol, or bisoprolol in correct doses. So the COMET trial was an attempt to say, is one better than the other? And there was lots of mechanistic trials and then a mortality trial and because of the way that it was designed, and you can ask why, but it was against short-acting metoprolol, and already the Merit HF trial using long-acting metoprolol was already in progress and didn't have its results yet, so they chose short-acting. And so it's always criticized that in a mortality study, carvedilol versus short-acting metoprolol, carvedilol had better results on, on its um, other um, secondary endpoints as well. So it's never going to be repeated because of that. It is, I always say it's the one body of knowledge that we have of carvedilol versus bitoprolol, and it was significant and significant in ejection fraction and significant in other endpoints. So it can be criticized. The dose that was chosen also, I think it was uh, 50 twice a day. Again, I, they say they chose it because it was the most common dose out there at the time in kind of real-world treatment, and the carvedilol dose is 25 twice a day, and the, 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 the attained dose for long-acting metoprolol is 200 a day, so you really, unfortunately, it's still apples to oranges. There's not really a direct, so, but I still say that's the data out there, and carvedilol did beat metoprolol, so I'll go with Jagan on that one. That carvedilol is my uh, beta blocker of choice, and, and a lot from both the individual trials um, as well as that head-to-head. 
Yeah, Dr. Narula. And just to add to Jill, uh, Jill's comment, I mean, 200 milligrams of uh, uh, long-acting metoprolol, it is almost unachievable in the patients of heart Very failure. And I was quite surprised when the European trials demonstrated that they could achieve a dose of about 167 milligrams on an average in the patients with heart failure. So that was one important uh, thing. And a question from uh, Roger. What about the presynaptic beta-2 receptors, Roger? Mm -hmm. Sorry, what, what about what? The presynaptic beta-2 receptors. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the issue there comes in with polymorphism and issues of uh, whether you can get more norepinephrine release or less norepinephrine release depending on the beta receptor polymorphism that you have. Um, there's been many groups showing that polymorphism can affect um, the heart failure, one, responsiveness to treatment, not specifically beta blocker, and also uh, heart failure outcomes. Uh, the data has never, you know, never been too convincing for me. But what Jaya is alluding to is the fact that you can get norepinephrine release with beta two receptors if you don't block them. That may uh, presynaptically that may affect the uh, uh, synaptic cleft and then increase norepinephrine levels there. Um, I, I've, I've reviewed the data many times, looking at you know specifically biologically and molecularly. I, I can't say I've been totally convinced that uh, one way or the other. Um, I still keep an open mind about beta-2 receptors having really dual modality and, and, and may, there may be some dosage effect that we can't completely uh, look, look over. So before we entirely leave the beta-2 receptor story, uh, there was a, an interesting meta-analysis back in February in the uh, inaugural issue of Jack Heart Failure looking at a meta-analysis of uh, four heart failure trials, four beta blocker trials in the subgroup of patients who had atrial fibrillation and it came to a startling conclusion which was that beta blockers were of no benefit in patients with atrial fibrillation. And there is a very nice uh, accompanying editorial by Mike Bristow who obviously is uh, a, a, a giant in the field of adrenergic receptors. But one of the things that he pointed out is that in atrial fibrillation, you want to block the AV node. Um, and if you look at the population of beta receptors in the AV node, it's about 50% of them are, are beta 2. And so the question then is, is one of the reasons why, if this is a true observation, that there's a lack of benefit in patients with atrial fibrillation, either we're not effectively blocking beta-2 receptors in the AV node, or maybe we need to use much, much higher doses of beta blockers in general. I don't know if anyone wants to care to comment on that, that I mean, observation. Who, who cares about the AV node when you have atrial I mean, you want to stabilize atrial fibrillation, and AV node is to stabilize the rhythm. So I think, uh, you know, I read Mike's editorial on this, it's a little bit self-serving, clearly, uh, what is but uh, it, I, I think that, you know, those two things have to be put in context. I mean, you sometimes use a lot of beta blockers to try to block the AV node, and you get detrimental effect because you're just, you know, pushing a lot of beta blockade, trying to block the AV node, but I think you have to sort of think about what happens to the atrial myocardium and whether that's stabilized or not. Actually, the beta-2 receptors on the myocytes also, their polymorphism is associated with sudden death. So in speaking of... Oh, no, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I agree with the dose element, just because with carvedilol and, and, and advanced heart failure, it'd be, it might be hard to actually get adequate doses to actually block the response. So patients may be left with very fast heart rates, which actually may be limiting their ability to improve. So I, I do think there's a dose element that goes on at that point in time that may trump what you need to do with the beta receptors. So I'd like to come back to, to novel treatments of uh, targeting circa, targeting the ranidine receptor. But before we do that, I don't want to completely leave the field of clinical trials. Uh, and I think it's important, if we're going to talk about beta blockers, we sort of have to unpack the best trial. Roger alluded to it with Mike Bristow and Bucindalol. But Mike, you were a, a member of the, the, the best investigators. The one beta blocker, if you will, that... Um, was found not to be helpful in, in heart failure, but that's really just the beginning, isn't it? First of all, why was the trial stopped? And there's some very specific language about why the Data Safety and Monitoring Board stopped the trial. Yeah, no, there, there, there was. I, I co-chaired that trial and actually was, was blinded, uh, which is probably one of the reasons it ended up getting stopped. But the, the thought was, what was happening was the, timing was the timing was poor. The other trials were coming in. It was clear that beta blockers uh, 
were effective treatment for heart failure. And so the totality of evidence suggested that the beta blocker should, uh, should be ther part of therapeutic uh, modalities used, used to treat these patients, and it was felt unethical to continue with the placebo group. Uh, the trial actually was stopped, you know, as it was stopped, it was stopped with a very strong trend. I mean, had the thing been allowed to go on, it prob probably would have crossed over and been significant. But I think, I think that the, the difference in best uh, is not that the trial was stopped early. One of, the, one of the studies that we did, one of the database studies we did, was to look at the population that was studied in the other trials It was part of our trial. Uh, our, the, the best trial was the only one that had a significant number of blacks in the trial. And in fact, if you looked at the, if you took the patients from BEST who uh, were like the European studies, like the other studies for that matter, uh, which were essentially left out blacks, we got exactly the same result. And we got a point estimate for harm with the blacks. And it really looks as though, as with beta block, as with ACE inhibitors, uh, the, you know, the declaration of black race is at least a crude phenotypic marker of some underlying difference uh, in how those drugs are handled. So I think Bucindolol, in a sense, I mean, I'm no big Bucindolol fan or anything like that, but, but I think it probably got a bad rap, and I think it probably works just as well as anything else in that setting. But BEST is an interesting trial for that reason. I think it also tends to be misquoted. I don't think it really showed that, that it didn't work. Um, there's pretty, there was a strong trend, and again, the data support the view that in the population that was studied in the other trials, it worked similarly. And so now there are some developments about the alpha 2C polymorphisms and whether or not that influenced the results. Dr. Neroli, can you comment on that? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Narula. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, this was uh, this was a paper from, uh, and we were actually discussing uh, with uh, Roger, and I would like uh, a comment from Roger on this. That uh, this was a PNAS study where they demonstrated clearly, if you remember, the one where they did the the um, the, uh, the uh, transduction, the gene transductions in the in the myocytes, and um, uh, in cultures they demonstrated the effect of. Uh, uh, Bucindolol versus Carvedilol in those which had the, uh, not the alpha 2C, but the beta 1 receptor polymorphisms, whether it was glycine rich versus uh, uh, arginine rich, and uh, demonstrated that when it was arginine rich, basically Bucindolol did better than um, uh, uh, the Carvedilol. So I would, I would ask uh, Roger how, how he reacts to that. I'm seeing him smiling. I mean, when you look at the data, so they took uh, uh, big transplant uh, hearts from transplanted patients. The explants, they look, you know, they know, they knew the polymorphism, and they brought the tissue in the lab and did these dose responses with norepinephrine and saw how brucindolol or carvedilol blocked them. And based on the polymorphism, they were able to show that usually brucindolol works better in one of the polymorphisms as opposed to the other. And that's really the, the, the data set that they have. I mean, is that convincing to me? No. Is that convincing to many people? Um, I mean, no, not really. I mean, having done a lot of these uh, uh, explanted hearts and, and, and knowing how they work in terms of timing and the, how the preparations are, you really just can't correlate these types of data to clinical, directly clinical events. But this is, they, they have, and some people believe them, and some people are not totally convinced. I think there is a better responsiveness of the myocardium when you have specific polymorphism versus the other. Whether that translates into a clinical uh, improvement, I'm, I'm not really sure. So you're not holding your breath. You don't think that we're going to do pharmacogenomics testing in our heart failure patients before deciding which beta blocker to start? Not for beta blockers. We may be doing it for other things. I mean, we're already doing it for Plavix, right? I mean, you know, I think there's there's definitely pharmacogenomics and uh, responsiveness to drugs is, is is out there. It's going to become probably more prevalent in cardiovascular diseases. But I don't think for beta blockade, especially not for Bucindolol. So, Andy, I have a question, which is, do we have it all wrong? <laughs> I mean, 
is the benefit that we see with beta blockers completely independent about all the things that we said, and it's just due to heart rate lowering. And the reason why I ask that is that there's data from the SHIFT trial, which was a study of evabridine, which blocks the IF channel or the I-funny channel. Um, and the only thing this drug does is slow sinoatrial rate. In a multicenter prospective randomized trial, it decreased heart failure hospitalizations and decreased the primary endpoint of heart failure hospitalizations and, and cardiovascular death. Is that all we need to do, just slow heart rate and not worry about genetic polymorphisms and everything else? Well, I, I don't think it's all we need to do, but I think it uh, points out <clears throat> maybe where the future of treatment of heart failure is going. I mean, one of the um, dirty little secrets that we're not discussing is that beta blockers actually make patients feel bad. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> right, it causes depression, lethargy, impotence, and all these other bad things, and, and maybe why it's difficult to get patients who even physiologically tolerate the beta blockers. And so I think we can learn a lot from beta blockers, and certainly the, uh, uh, the SHIFT trial was asking the question, if you just slow heart rate, can you get benefit? And you know, in that study, they really looked at clinical outcomes, which is obviously the most important thing, but there's not a lot of information uh, about the physiologic effects. So I think it still leaves room for other types of treatment. And I think where we're going in heart failure is eventually to get rid of beta blockers completely. Once we understand the mechanism by which they're benefiting the patients, we can target those particular mechanisms, one of them may be heart rate slowing, and not block all the beneficial effects of sympathetic stimulation. And I think the patients would be a lot better off. So I'll, I'll be controversial and say that I think beta blockers can teach us a lot, but we shouldn't stop there. And we shouldn't worry so much about which beta blocker to use, but we should be worrying more about how can we replace beta blockers with better, better drugs. So until we have those better drugs, uh, Dr. Krakoff, how do we get patients established on these medicines? And, you know, as Dr. Mark said, high side effect profile, people don't really feel well. You know, and there's certainly overlap between treating patients with systemic hypertension, treating patients with congestive heart failure. What tricks of the trade do you have to share with us about how to get patients on a drug which ultimately may be good for them, but they don't want to take? Well, I have the ad advantage uh, of not dealing with the heart failure population. I deal with the pre-heart failure population. People have, by and large, very normal hearts, and they're hypertensive and at risk. Uh, and they're at risk for uh, heart disease and stroke. I emphasize that because in the last decade, it's been apparent that the role, the, the track record for beta blockers, either given as a, a monotherapy or in combination with regard to prevention of stroke, is, is not what you would might think ought, it ought to be. And consequently, I think among those of us who treat a lot of hypertension and people with good hearts, uh, we're, t we're backing off on beta blockers using less and less. I mean good in the sense of both not having ischemic disease or not having a, a prior coronary disease. And there are a lot of those. Uh, and, and there are a number of good meta-analyses and retrospective looks at, at the studies. So uh, that doesn't, doesn't mean a patient who's responded well shouldn't continue. Uh, if they, but that's really we're shifting away and much more towards drugs that lower blood pressure and have as little or no effects on the lungs, on glucose tolerance, uh, because the patients feel better, and it looks like from the point of view of stroke alone that they do better. So I think that we're going to see a reduction in use of beta blockers, certainly not an abandonment, but a reduction. So Jill, I want to read um, two statistics to you. Uh, in the, from the Improved Heart Failure Database, this is a registry of um, patients with chronic heart failure. 84% of heart failure patients without devices received beta blockers. Only 15% of them took them at recommended doses. Mm -hmm. And the median resting heart rate was 72 beats per minute. Uh, from the Europeans, just to show that there's no difference between Europeans and, and Americans when it comes to delivering health care, 86.7% of patients received beta blockers, but target doses of the approved beta blockers in Europe, uh, patients uh, the, the target doses were reached only uh, about 20-25% of the time, and the mean resting heart rate was 72 beats per minute. So 
clearly there are some trends there, uh, you know, on both sides of the Atlantic that we're not very effective in delivering care. So what are the, the barriers to delivering guideline recommended therapies to patients? What tricks, what systems can we put in place to improve care delivery? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Andy spoke to it and Larry spoke to it. I mean, these are patients with normal hearts and hypertension. You don't necessarily want to have the side effects and there's a different game at stake when you're talking about severe heart failure. I think that up titrating beta blockers is difficult, especially if the patients are, as they progress in more advanced heart failure, they have, they have side effects of hypotension, worsening heart failure and fatigue. However, and we've all seen this in our practices, if you do get patients to the recommended doses, we see a lot of patients improve and we know that from the trials. So what works is really being, you know, incredibly diligent with talking to the patients and takes a lot of time and energy and kind of doing little tricks that we all have, whether it's separating out doses, taking them with meals, telling them they might improve. The other thing I'll differ with Andy is that the patients who do improve, they still may have the fatigue, but the, you know, when, when you do have an improvement in ejection fraction and an improvement in kind of hard outcomes, I do think patients do feel better. So I think the tricks are just the real aggressiveness of saying it matters to get it to the doses. And I think the people that probably do it better are kind of organized practices and programs that probably have mid-level providers that are kind of doing the up titration because it takes an enormous amount of time. And it's talking to the patients and a lot of time about explaining side effects. They should go away. And there are tricks we do. We, I mean, we get a lot of our patients to the right doses. And it, I think it makes a huge difference. So those are unfortunately depressing statistics that we know, but takes, I think, kind of group type programs to get these patients to the right doses. And that's how important it's all that. When I get a heart failure consult, the most important thing I do is probably increase the Lasix and increase the Carvedilol. I mean, it's not like every patient we're offering advanced therapies to. So I, I think it's an that's an extremely important element to bring up. Yeah, that's a great point. Let me just follow up on that and, and ask, you know, I think both patients and physicians are sort of behavioral economists. And, it, and if you put something to incentivize them, they'll respond to it. And if you're talking about taking a drug which causes side effects, that's not really a good stimulus to get them to take the drug. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about biomarker-guided therapy, whether or not you think it works, whether or not this is a way to try to be change the behavior more so, I think, of the prescribing physician than the patient themselves. What do you, what do you think about that? Jill, yeah. Well, I think that, first of all, you can, we'll talk, I'll talk about biomarker-guided therapy in a moment, but also just with patients being aware of their ejection fraction sometimes also is kind of a, not that always EF it improves, and it's, EF is not necessarily, it's a surrogate endpoint. I think that for physicians to follow things, I think it's costly. I still think you need to get, I personally don't do, but I think to convince physicians to do it, it's important. And I think that we still have the target doses. So I am not necessarily the hugest fan, but I think broadly in terms of physician practices, it's helpful. I don't know if others have thoughts on that. Yeah, Mike? Yeah, well, I, I think the first, the first line of defense is convincing the physicians to, to be aggressive uh, about, the, about up titrating. The difficulty is you see the side effects, but you don't see the benefit. And the advantage of, uh, of biomark one advantage of biomarker guidance is, you know, at least you see something. Uh, and that's, but that's important because a patient, you know, you give a patient a pill and they feel worse, uh, gee, you feel bad too. And, uh, but physicians historically, you know, do want to avoid that sort of thing. So actually, I think the biomarker guided therapy um, probably has a lot to recommend it. So we started off talking about molecular mechanisms. I want to go back to that, particularly now since beta blockers are given at least a, a slight black eye in terms of the side effect profile. Let's talk about new therapies for heart failure, which are really targeted at molecular mechanisms. And, and Dr. Marks, I'll turn to you first. Tell me about um, some of the novel uh, therapeutic um, treatments that we have to target the ranitidine receptor who target its phosphorylation, get it dephosphorylated, et cetera, the RICALs and, and the class of medication. So um, what we've been working on, as you know, is the concept that there's a stress-induced leak of the ranidine receptor calcium release channel on the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the source of calcium for muscle contraction. And what we've found in both uh, patients with heart failure and in multiple animal models of heart failure is that the stress of heart failure, by that I mean the hyperadrenergic and hyperoxidative state, causes a, a leak in this channel that depletes the precious pool of calcium and decreases the signal for muscle contraction. 
And uh, there, we have discovered a cl new class of drugs, you mentioned RICALs, that specifically prevent that leak. And in animal models, they uh, inhibit heart failure progression and are antiarrhythmic. And in addition, that same leak occurs in skeletal muscle and they improve exercise capacity. So you have the potential to target the three key contributors, I think, to bad outcome and uh, poor quality of life and heart failure patients. Uh, and we are now in phase two clinical trials where the initial signals look good that there is a pharmacologic effect in heart failure patients. And uh, obviously this is gonna be a long, slow path and very costly. But what I would like to point out is, you know, I can't tell you right now whether these drugs are going to ever be approved for heart failure, but I, I think you can use it as an example of trying to understand molecular mechanism and uh, looking at signaling pathways that make sense. So we've known for decades that the hyperadrenergic state of heart failure is contributing to heart failure progression. And there are a lot of potential therapeutic targets in that pathway. And I think that that is where a lot of the focus should be, either in academic labs or in the pharmaceutical industry, which right now is terrified of heart failure. And it's because I think that there have been some bad guesses and, and poorly designed trials and whatever, uh, costing hundreds of millions of dollars. So we're kind of stuck right now because it does take a long time and a huge cost to develop a drug for heart failure. and. You have to have pretty good evidence that what you're trying is new and, and uh, efficacious. For example, to get to the point where we are now in phase two, we've spent over $70 million. And looking at a phase three, of course, would be hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, the challenge is, is enormous, but it's a very promising time because we are beginning to understand more about mechanisms and honing in on causes of cardiac dysfunction and arrhythmia and muscle weakness rather than blindly treating symptoms or you know knocking out the whole sympathetic drive which i think you know was a huge landmark advance i don't want to minimize that but we need to learn from our clinical experience i think it's very informative so i would like to say that you know the next 10 years or so we're going to be learning a lot more about how to really improve cardiac function, decrease arrhythmias, improve skeletal muscle function, and have a bigger impact on uh, patients with heart failure. And Roger, you're, you know, to be commended for the, the CUPID trial, it's been a long arc to get to CUPID. Um, can you give us an update as to where uh, we are right now with uh, adeno-associated viral delivery of circa 2A gene? Um, what's the future look like for that end of uh, the molecular target? Yeah, so as uh, Andy mentioned, it's, a, it's always a long road. Um, so our approach has been to um, deliver circuit 2A using AV vectors, and associated vectors, delivered through coronary infusion. So it's a gene therapy trial. And we started in 2007 with a phase one. We completed a phase uh, two in uh, 2010. Uh, and we just published the three-year follow-up of the phase two trial, which showed continued clinical benefits at three years following gene transfer uh, with improved survival uh, in the patients uh, who were treated. Now, this was a small study. Uh, we followed that study with a phase uh, 2B3 trial, which is finishing uh, in the next few months, and that's 250 patients, uh, 125 receiving circa, and 125 receiving saline, and the results will be out in January 2015 after a one-year follow-up from the last patient injected. So um, again, it's been a long, arduous road, uh, and hopefully we'll have some more definitive data by um, in the next uh, 15 months. The, the two of you are giants in this field. Um, I've worked with both of you. I heard about rayanidine receptors. I heard about Circa 2A. Um, both would argue that it's the most important molecular mechanism uh, within the myocyte. What other molecular targets out there uh, right now that are being targeted by other groups for, for therapy? Um, what else can we anticipate in the, in the future? I'll ask you, uh, Dr. Marks, first. 
Uh, as you know, there are uh, <clears throat> calcium sensitizers for myosin and other components of the sarcomere. And uh, I think that the data there is uh, still to be determined, uh, but there's been some problems with clinical trials, and one of the issues there would be increased ATP consumption, and uh, that would be stressful on the heart, which is already energy uh, challenged. Uh, I think there have been other uh, therapeutics that have been looked at, as including fibrosis inhibitors, and again, uh, I think that there are many, many targets, uh, phosphodiesterases, phosphatases. The challenge there, of course, is developing uh, tissue organ-specific therapy because, again, you don't want to block these enzymes throughout the body. Uh, <clears throat> I do think, though, that it really is going to take a um, massive effort to look at all these pathways and figure out where the potential therapeutic targets are. I've been on the advisory panel of some of the big pharma and trying to convince them to use their enormous resources to target these pathways, which I think is beyond the scope of any academic lab, is uh, met with a lot of uh, skepticism on their part because I don't think that they really appreciate the tremendous opportunities that are out there. But if you look at where the physiologic regulation of cardiac contractility lies and begin to ask the question of what molecules are regulating that path, those pathways, uh, it really lends itself to uh, tremendous opportunities. But right now, I'm not aware of any uh, exciting programs that are pursuing that. So it's kind of frustrating. <clears throat> So we have a few more minutes. I can open up to the to the floor if anyone has any specific questions for the panelists. Yes, Dr. Fuster. Hmm. So I guess uh, I have to comment about the trial that was just finished with the blockers in the acute myocardial infarction, which is in two hours in the ambulance. Well, I was following this information last week. And in this trial, metoprolol was given intravenously with three different dosages of five milligrams. It was a blind study where ejection fraction was measured at one month with magnetic resonance imaging. And the results were outstanding. There uh, were 250 patients randomized. And in fact, the ejection fraction, uh, well, the infar size was, the, was uh, decreased by 25% in the group treated with metoprolol. And the results were so exciting that we are starting a trial now, which is worldwide, with 1,000 people there with myocardial infarction, there was anterior myocardial infarction that will be injected with metoprolol in the ambulance, so at least within the first two hours. It doesn't work if you give the drug after three hours in terms of infar size, which is quite different to the discussion that took place here. And, um, and interestingly, the, we have now data with carvedilol, and it's in the peak model is better than metoprolol. Uh, just and uh, because this study evolved from the peak model and actually evolved in this institution about uh, four years ago, and now we apply this to humans. So I'm just saying that the story of beta blockers doesn't end with the chronic patient, but maybe we have something in front of us in the acute, in the acute stage. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, all those patients were revascularized, right? And it, they had to receive the metoprolol prior to yeah. revascularization? Yeah, well, into details, all patients actually were revascularized with uh, PCI uh, afterwards. So it's quite interesting because they all had uh, intervention, but the infar size was different. And actually, um, uh, in the American Heart Association, I cannot re actually present the results, but we have enzyme data. Uh, we have ejection fraction, infar size, and enzyme data, which is quite fascinating also. It's really interesting to hear those results because if you, if you think back over the last 10 years, there have been a number of adjunctive pharmacologic approaches to try to minimize infarct size, to block reperfusion injury. Glucose, insulin, potassium failed miserably. Magnesium failed miserably. Beta blockers work. I don't know if anyone of the panelists want to speculate as to why it may may help you. Yeah. So I'm going out on a limb here because I don't have any data, but 
there is a uh, at least theoretic possibility that one thing that's going on is that you're able to decrease calcium overload of mitochondria, which could be contributing to necrosis and apoptosis. And it would be uh, a question whether you've looked at that in the animal models. We did actually, and we just it was just published. What really is affected is the apoptotic phenomena, which is evolving around the infarct. And the question now is to look at the molecular mechanisms by which the apoptotic phenomena uh, is affected. Uh, as, you, as you clearly uh, uh, said, the infarct size over a period of four hours grows very rapidly through an apoptotic mechanism. And the beta blocker, that's what it actually stops. So I would be interested to know, and, and you could uh, look at this in the animal models, whether there's calcium overload in the mitochondria, and that would be an irreversible process, and so it may explain why you need to treat in that early phase, and if once that's occurred, there's no, no way to stop that. And uh, again, that could be uh, caused by my favorite thing, a leak of calcium from the SR, which could be inhibited both by the anti-hyperadrenergic stay effect of beta blockers as well as antioxidant effect. Uh, but that would kind of tie together the mechanism and it would allow you to think about other types of therapy as well that could uh, target that uh, mitochondrial calcium overload. I'm going to get to George's uh, question. Uh, one thing yeah, I yeah, could yeah. just add to that. Dr. Fuster, I don't know whether you remember or not, when uh, you were at Mass General and I had them, uh, shown you the data from the uh, uh, canine experiments where we had done the myocardial infarction and uh, uh, given the beta blockers intravenously and demonstrated with the technetium fibrinogen uh, targeting that the targeting was predominantly on the endothelium. So the damage essentially was occurring through the uh, leaky endothelium. And uh, that leak was prevented by, given the, by giving the beta blocker. So the possibility could be that it is not only the myocyte calcium overload in the mitochondria, but the possibility of protecting the endothelium and the endothelial integrity, as well as the microvascular plugging that may also be prevented by giving the uh, beta blockers. Yeah, George. Yes, um, I'd like to stay in the uh, post myocardial infarction uh, era a little bit. Again, not addressed in the, in the, in the panel so far, but uh, we, start, we have an innovative uh, device uh, that we're actually starting in a, in a trial here uh, in patients with a configuration of a left uh, a ventricular aneurysm in the apex. It's a relatively simple method. Uh, can implant a, a device that would exclude uh, the, uh, the apex and uh, therefore sort of try to reduce the volumes of the LV uh, pretty much the similar way originally uh, Dr. Batista tried to do with the operation except that you know this uh, now we can just do with a simple left catheterization without uh, the morbidity of the operation. Uh, uh, so far volumes have been reduced in Europe. The pivotal trial is here in patients with uh, three and four uh, uh, class CHF try to see if this is going to reduce uh, uh, to be reduced over time. Um, so um, the question is, what what do you think the mechanisms would be from that, and at the at the at the molecular level, and it's just the remodeling of the, it's just the ratio of the two volumes, or could there be much more uh, in relation to this uh, to this type of approach in the, in CHF? Sure. Sure. The short answer is I have no idea. Um, it would be fascinating to get some data and try to look at things at a cellular level. Are there animal models? There must have been animal models where this was tested. You mean at the at the level of the heart to sort of get the explant heart for the from the uh, yeah. from the animals? Yeah, the, yeah. I, the, the, the uh, indeed the animal models were into uh, just the feasibility and. Um, uh, I would say the stability of the device, not so, so much so into have, the long-term CHF. Have effect, you so I'm not sure we have the length of time necessary. Have you measured uh, serum catecholamine levels in the patients before and after the device? Uh, no, not yet, but uh, you know, this is just in the very beginning. Sure. Just uh, you know, by about 50 patients or so in, in Europe, the device has been approved in Europe. But as you know, the, the clinical data required for an approval in Europe is very minimal. 
and really now it's going into a real, uh, uh, you know, investigation and uh, what are all the 30 sites in the U.S. and really we're going into this pathway. But so, I think it would be the, the effect in the neurohormonal axis would be fascinating. Yeah, I think that would be very interesting to look at. You know, George, I'm wondering too, if you can just sample coronary sinus blood and measure norepinephrine levels pre and, and post uh, implant of the device and see if there's any difference in norepinephrine. I mean, George, the ACORN device, when they first started, you know, with reduction of trying to uh, prevent the LV dilatation, at the cellular level, uh, when they did the pig studies, canine studies, you know, everything looked great. Calcium cycling was improved. But obviously, we know that in human data, did not really correlate very well with that. So I'd be, I'd be a little skeptical that just trying to restrict the heart from expanding is going to be uh, beneficial in the long term. I mean, there, there are other mechanisms, molecular and external, that if you're not fixing those, by just sort of restricting the size, is that you're going to be able to do that. The only caveat, uh, Roger, could be that uh, by all these devices, whether that was the Batista's procedure or whether that was an Acon device, you were actually um, uh, interfering with the normal physiology of a fiber flow in the myocardial contraction. So uh, that may not be a problem when you are excluding only the apical region. Mm. So it might. Yeah, the flow and the vortex inside the heart would be more favorable. I mean, in, in this type of study, it presumes that actually the regional wall motion is very critical because it, it would presume that the, there will be some normal myocardium in there in order for the device to hook. So it's really a selected group of patients that we would, that we would include here, those post-MI and uh, with aneurysm. Yeah, one last question, Sandy. Uh, <laughs> when, when all this calcium gets into the myocyte, I, I gather it gums it up in some way. So, I mean, what is the mechanism for everything sequentially to fall apart once the calcium gets there? Um, so, I think it's uh, probably multifactorial, but one uh, issue is that once the calcium is in the cell, it gets pumped out, and so you're actually depleting the pool of calcium inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and that's the driving force for muscle contraction. And so it's kind of like taking a screwdriver and sticking a hole in your gas tank, and then when you press on the pedal, there's no oomph left. Uh, I think there are also cellular toxicities of the calcium, and one of them could be mitochondrial calcium overload, and we've looked at that and found that that, in fact, is the case. And when you overload the mitochondria with calcium, there's a number of effects. One is you stop producing the ATP, so there's a loss of energy in the heart. And another is you increase the reactive oxygen species that are released from the mitochondria, and those are toxic to many different processes in the cell. So the uh, answer to your question is that there are specific pathways that the calcium is activating that are toxic. And there's also the loss of calcium from the cell, which in itself decreases the strength of contraction of the muscle. Well, given the hour, I'd like to thank Dr. Marks, Dr. Shaw, and all our panelists for an excellent discussion tonight. Thank you.